gents, this is the moment you've waited for. <laughs> yep. Hello, my fellow showmen. It's, oh, it is, oh, I'm very much looking forward to this one. So, hello, my fellow showmen, and welcome to this Christmas special of Mickey's Subsidiaries, a spin-off of The Kingdom of Isolation, where we take a look at the films that are under the Disney umbrella, but not from the Disney Animation Studios themselves. So we're talking studios they've created, like Touchstone Pictures and Hollywood Pictures, uh, and also the acquisitions that they've made from the likes of Marvel, Lucasfilm, and Fox. And it's the latter of those three that we are going to be uh, delving into uh, to today for this for this year's Christmas special. I was going to do two Christmas specials with the other one being Home Alone 2, but uh, because of the time constraints that I've got to deal with, taking into account that I've got to uh, get the rest of the animated classics lineups done by the end of the month. So uh, no pressure, folks. Rest assured, I've only got six to go. Moana, Ralph Breaks the Internet, Frozen 2, Ryan and the Last Dragon, Encanto, and Strange World. Wish is still in theaters right now, folks. But when that comes onto Disney+, Plus, you, you can guarantee there'll be an episode on that film when it comes onto Disney+. Plus. But anyway, <clears throat> so what is the subject for this year's Christmas special, folks. Well, judging by the intro, it's The Greatest Showman, based on the life of P.T. Uh, Phineas Taylor Barnum, who created the Barnum and Bailey Circus. This film came out in 2017, distributed by 20th Century Fox, now under the name 20th Century Studios. Now, with me being as big a fan of this film as I am, I... I had to get a fellow showman on board for this film <laughs> uh, to, help come, to help cover this film. Now, he's no stranger to doing the occasional special episode for me because a couple of years ago, you might remember, folks, for those that have been with us from day one, um, Alan actually uh, helped me do the uh, do one of uh, that year's Christmas specials with the Muppet Christmas Carol, which you can find at the top right of your screens, alongside all the King of Isolation episodes that we've done so far up to this point so so uh in this case uh alan is going to be the philip carlisle to my uh uh pt barnum if you will if he's okay with that of course i'll i'll take it <laughs> but yeah uh, oh it's so oh so good to have you back now now you've now you've made me aware over the last couple of days that you've just finished doing um uh a stage show uh about a week or so ago that's right uh I actually just uh, did the last show on Sunday, Terry Pratchett's Hogfather. Ah, yes, Terry Pratchett, one of the great, one of the greatest authors uh, of all time. I mean, he's he's made so many incredible stories. Some of them mm -hmm. adapted, some of them not only adapted for the stage, but some of them have even been adapted into films and their TV shows. That's right. And uh, this production was staged by Straw Moddy. And uh, okay. we're going to be back going to be back again at the end of may early june for a production of terry pratchett's men at arms ah there we go so um yeah that's uh that's definitely gonna be one to look forward to folks but yeah like i say where do we even begin with summing up the great showman folks because since it came since it came out it has just continued growing its fan base every single day since it came out six years ago and granted despite the slow start word of mouth started developing the momentum for the greatest showman and here in the uk right up until the day before it got released on home media it was still being played in cinemas across the uk before it got released on home media that is crazy so you're talking somewhere in the region of about about six months, roughly, between when it got released and coming out on home media. I And it's very rare that a film has that long a cinematic run because you normally expect it to be anywhere between four to six weeks normally. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I say, we, I say we delve straight into this absolute gem because uh, I do believe... This still holds the record to this day of the highest grossing live action musical of all time, I believe. Uh, I will 
I'll do- we'll, we'll double check that when we get into the legacy portion of the scores, folks. Yes. So, so interestingly, they decide to give us a, a quick little, um, a uh, quick little bit of nostalgia with one of the classic 20th century Fox and just, mm-hmm. and then boom, first song of the film right out the gate. That's how you do an intro folks. <laughs> <laughs> Even just that um, 20th century Fox. I love that. I love when movies yeah. give little nods to the past like that. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, 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 the guys that were in charge of the music uh, in this case. Uh, it was uh, John Debney and um, Joseph Trapanese who were in charge of doing the score for this film. Now, one of my... It's not so much a criticism against the film, it's more a criticism against what was released from this film because, yes, you've got the soundtrack that's got all the songs, but the film score, nowhere to be seen. It's not on Spotify. It's not on CDs. It's not even on vinyl. You can't find the film score anywhere. And I cannot fathom why. Yeah. Wouldn't you want to release that? Yeah, like- ex- exactly. I've, I've touted numerous times before. I love film scores. So do and I. This, and this would have been a great one to add to my collection. Yeah. But... But nevertheless, let's let's not worry about those uh, sour grapes at the moment and delve yeah, into sure. delve into the gentleman that made these amazing um, these amazing uh, songs, and that being Benj Pasek and Justin Paul. Now they do have a fair amount of experience in terms of uh, songwriting because they've done quite a bit of work for the world of musical theatre. Some of those projects, including a musical adapt... uh, They wrote the the score to a musical adaptation of James and the Giant Peach, which premiered in 2010. But their biggest success story is from 2015 and Dear Evan Hansen, a a musical that I still haven't got round to seeing yet, but I have heard so many good things about a compromise, though, was getting to see the film adaptation of the musical, which has garnered a fair amount of criticism for, uh, given the fact that the original Evan Hansen, Ben Platt, reprised his role. And given the age he was when the film came out, um, there was some concern that he would still be able to uh, portray that um high school character but i i did i didn't take any of that criticism um on board at all i i just went into it with um forming my opinion on what the film would be like mm. and i'll say this it is very rare that a film manages to hit me on such a deep emotional level it given some of the mature themes that uh, not just the musical, but the film uh, covers as well regarding mental health issues. There was even one point when I went to go and see it where I did end up uh, having to step out of the uh, cinema screen for a few minutes because I was just that emotionally overwhelmed. And I think in a way that definitely helped with... um, with uh, the emotional impact of uh, of the film, because the songs in Dear Evan Hansen are absolutely fantastic, and the songs he- the songs in The Greatest Showman as well, absolutely incredible as well. Mm-hmm. The Greatest Show is the first song that we get treated to oh. in this film. Yeah, as I, like I say, this is how you do an intro, yep. right? A banger right out of the starting gate. Yeah, and the first of our the first of our uh, superstars that we get here. So um, I haven't got 
uh, as many names as I normally do when I go through the cast of these uh, films. Because because when I do the when I do these Kingdom of Isolation episodes or Mickey subsidiaries or d- depending on what film I'm covering, folks, I normally have a, an extensive list of uh, the cast that I go through. And um, not particularly in this case, but I still I still have got like all the main characters uh, covered. Uh, case in point, P.T. Barnum himself, portrayed by Hugh Jackman, who interestingly does have a background in musical theatre in himself. And uh, a couple of those uh, musical theatre projects um, ended up being uh, film adaptations as well. Uh, there was uh, an ad- there was a film adaptation of Oklahoma in 1999, and then the first t- the first time I came across Hugh Jackman uh, being involved in musical theater was the 2012 uh, film adaptation of Les Mis. One of one my of, favorite movies. Yeah, we just, we just, it's it's one of the biggest musicals in the world, and it's not hard to see why, especially given the fact it's been going for... When did it When did it first start? Was it like 1986, I think it was? Yeah, I, I think that's right. So, so, we're talk, so we're talking in the region of nearly 40 years for Les Mis, and that is... That's no mean feat, folks. For one of the, <laughs> that's no mean feat. I mean, I mean, you've had the likes of uh, Michael Ball and Alfie Bow portraying uh, that uh, title role. Um, but outside of musical theatre, Hugh Jackman has also uh, been involved in the X Men franchise as Wolverine, and one of my personal favourite films, um, which uh, which may or may not be part of the uh, season of sports films that I'm going to be covering here in the build-up to the Olympic Games in Paris next summer. Real Steel. It's it's definitely up there as one of my um one of my personal favorites. A great balance between uh the the action that we see in the ring with the robot boxing and of course uh the drama that we have throughout with uh the uh the tension between um Charlie and Max Kenton and um, throughout especially the first half of the film. Uh but but yeah I think so Hugh Jackman has been very, very busy here. Um, yeah. his, he also he yeah. also has a direct uh, Disney connection. He uh, yeah he in 1996 was in a production of the stage version of Beauty and the Beast in which he played Gaston. Oh my! Wo- oh, okay. And I'm already on board with that. Ah, oh, that is <laughs> that, that's brilliant. So, so there we go, folks. Uh, Hugh Jackman, like Alan said, he's got a direct Disney connection. Uh, now, now, he, now, Hugh Jackman has stated that um, this this film has been a dream project for him since two thousand and nine. So we're talking eight years before the film got released. Um, well, well, it's, well, it's technically nine years because um, he says here the film's nine develop nine year development process from conception to completion was in part due to the studio's unwillingness to take a risk on an original musical. I mean, I mean, especially with them. Um, I mean, in a way you can understand, you can understand why, because because uh, uh, a lot of studios, they rely on the superhero, the superhero films, your sequels, your franchises. Not many people, not many people take a risk on going for original films these days. Yes. Which is a shame. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but th- but thank goodness, thank goodness, we've got studios like thank goodness we've got studios like A twenty four with uh, yes. with with all, with all with all of the horror films they've done there. Hereditary, Midsummer. Mm-hmm. Um, what else have they done? Oh yes, the Oscar winning Everything Everywhere All at Once, folks. Uh, so yeah, uh, when. It- what finally sold the deal at 20th Century Fox was the future Oscar-nominated song "This Is Me," which we'll get into um, later on. Which had literally been written by uh, Pasek and Paul during the two-hour flight to the studio, uh, to the studio meeting where the film was greenlit. So the songwriters wrote a song on the flight to the studio, pitched it to the studio, boom, greenlit. Your film's ready to go. <laughs> yeah. And another thing I love about this incredible intro is how vibrant everything is, just from yes. just from all, just from all the stage into the choreography, and even the costumes that everybody has just 
Oh, those costumes no. are sumptuous. Absolutely, absolutely. Not only, not only just, not only from the the performers themselves, but capturing that time period really, really well. Hmm. Fantastic design work. Yeah, and uh, so, so then. So then the music starts to slow down, and we see a young, uh, uh, a young Barnum uh, with with his dad, and they end up going to visit uh, this family uh, with this young girl at uh, charity. And uh, even even from just those two looking at each other, they already that you can already see there's a connection starting to form right out the gate, um, and and causing causing each other to. Uh, to laugh when their uh, Barnum's trying to um, imitate um, what Charity's doing with their uh, drinking the tea. It's uh, it, it's I I, th- I think that's a pretty wholesome way of uh, is- uh, establishing uh, the connection that those two would end up having before Charity ends up having to go to finishing school. Unfortunately, mm. now uh, now the, the young Charity in this case um, is portrayed by uh, Skylar Dunn. Who is um, who's been really really into um, uh, she's been really into the uh, the world of uh, uh, acting and performing for quite a, a considerable amount of time um, uh, during her youth and 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 one of the, one of the things that's um, one of the things that is a shame when it comes to the um, uh, soundtrack, which brings us on to the next song, "A Million Dreams," and this I've, I've simply just put here a wholesome start between those two and on and an amazing uh finish when we get to the end of the song but it's it's the way the lighting is used throughout that particular um uh, sequence where you've got all the uh, where you've got the lights illuminating the various objects and bringing out those um uh, shadows and it's I I on I honestly I honestly just get it, that that moment still amazes me just seeing that lighting making all those um, uh, shadows which would end up um, transitioning into some of the animals that we would see um, uh, later on. Now we do hear we do hear a brief um, we do hear a, a couple of brief moments of uh, young charity singing. Uh, it's a. It is. It is a shame that uh, Skylar Dunn didn't get uh, credited on uh, on the soundtrack for this particular song. But I. Th- uh, but hey. But hey, well, not really much we can uh, do about that. But yeah. uh, hopefully, hopefully we get to see her in um, some uh, future uh, film project, uh, film and acting uh, projects once she uh, finishes. Um, once she finishes uh, school. Yes. Yeah. Um, so all so all grown up now is um, so so charity is now all grown up as is um, uh, bottom after uh, getting there, getting a job uh, going across the American um, uh, open plains, and you know, as, as, like so like I said regarding the costumes, Hugh Jackman looks looks great in men um, in in that uh, in that particular costume that he's. Uh, Wearing it at um, at this point in oh yeah the film yeah so he goes so he goes to see um so he goes to see uh, charity now that she's all grown up and she's portrayed by Michelle Williams at uh, this um, uh, here now some of the other projects she's been involved in she's also been involved in uh, a direct Disney film um a live action film based around the Wizard of Oz uh, I believe Oz the Great and Powerful which also has James Franco uh, in it as well. Uh, she's also been in The Woman in Me, uh, where she was the narrator. Now, now you're thinking to yourself, The Woman in Me isn't that something regarding Britney Spears? Indeed, it is because it's because um, she's narrating. Um, uh, so I'll just try and get up and just, uh, just quickly. Uh, yeah, she's actually, um, yeah. She is, um, yeah. So the woman in me is actually an audio book that uh, Britney uh, Britney Spears released, um, uh, going through. Um, uh, 
uh, cons- uh, conserv- conservation, I think, whatever, whatever, whatever it is. But, but yeah, uh, Michelle Williams is, is actually the um, uh, the narrator of uh, the um, audio book. Oh, that's what it is. Uh, conservatorship. Right. That's what, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so that so that will um, so that will so that audio book will delve into a lot about what she went through during uh, the conservatorship uh, before she uh, managed to break free from it. Uh, if you will, and I and I guarantee you, on that day, a lot of Britney Spears fans would have been playing stronger. One of one of one of my personal favorite Britney Spears tracks, because um, I mean, I mean, the t- the title pretty much speaks for itself. Now that she's, um... but yeah, <clears throat> um, so uh, <clears throat> one of one of my one of my uh, I've got I've got a couple of uh, personal favorite shots from this. Um, from the second half of this million dreams sequence, where uh, it's it's the way huge it's the way Barnum just transitions from uh, dancing with charity to just smoothly transitioning to a marriage proposal, and I was like, I'm like, yeah, well, that's one way of doing that's one way of doing a proposal, <laughs> <laughs> and and um, was it, uh, one of the other uh, projects that uh, Michelle Williams was involved in. Uh, she was um, uh, she was the girlfriend or love interest, I believe, of Eddie Brock in the Venom movie starring yeah. Tom Hardy. Yeah, uh, ex girlfriend, but still love interest. Yes, that's uh, that. We'll, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Yeah. Um, and another um, uh, another film she was involved in was the Oscar nominated Manchester by the Sea. Which came out in around around, around twenty sixteen, uh, roughly give or take. Um, but um, uh, as I, and another another one of my um, another one of my favorite moments throughout this sequence is uh, when you see young um, the young Barnum try to steal a loaf of bread. A nice a nice little nod there to uh, Hugh Jackman portraying Jean Valjean, who. Um, who gets um, who gets time for stealing the bread, stealing the bread, and the rest because he tried to run. <clears throat> yes, yes, I've, yes, I'm I'm very clued in on them. Um, I'm very clued in on my uh, Malay and Malima's stuff. <laughs> and quite right too. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> um, and uh, well, another one of my favorite shots here is uh, when. Is when Hugh Jackman does that lift, and you have all those sheets l- sway- uh, swaying at the same time. Now, that would have either been done with a few, a fair number of fans to get the lift needed on those sheets, or there would have been a bit, or there would have been a small bit of CG involved in there. But either way, fantastic shot. And we transition to a few years later, where. Barnum is working for a uh, a shipping um, a shipping company, which ends up going bankrupt. How did they go bankrupt? Their entire uh, their entire their entire trading um, um their entire their entire trading fleet is at the bottom of the South China Seas. So yeah, everyone's without a job at this point. So hmm. Not the way you'd want to be dismissed from your job, folks. But um, but of course, taking into account uh, the fact that this took place anywhere between, uh, what is it? it started like um, a majority of it taking place in the early to mid nineteenth century, uh, and once the first act's out of the way, uh, we're into like the eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties, roughly. And one of the, um, we actually see that uh, Barnum does take uh, the um, uh, the deeds to the um, uh, to the fleet of ships that uh, have sunk. Uh, they, they they become important uh, shortly, folks. Um, but he heads he heads home uh, and. 
there's just, there's just, there's just something about having these cute young kids involved in these in these sort of projects. I have brought it up numerous times in recent episodes of The Kingdom of Isolation, where Disney have a cute, Disney bring up a couple of cute kids. Perito from Puss in Boots: The Last Wish comes in with a cuteness overload and then passes out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, does it? And um, so he manages. So Barnum manages to make this um, wishing machine. Um, just, just, just um, sort of like um, a little spinning lantern thing. Uh, but he, he lights it up. He ca- he gets it spinning, and again, just the visuals and the, and the lighting just add to the beauty of this moment and the kids one wishes to marry santa one uh, the other wishes for ballet slippers and then as the million dreams of reprise starts to play in the background charity wishes simply for happiness like this forever and then and then the kids start singing the reprise of a million dreams and this is one of this is one of those rare moments where it's just there's just something so beautiful about hearing hearing kids um, singing, and this is one of those cases where it 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 gets me every time, and I'm absolutely okay with that. <laughs> yeah, I've 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 I've, 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 I've talked I've talked about uh, how I've talked about previously how uh, Inside Out gets me every time emotionally. I am very excited. For the sequel, now that we've uh, had an introduction to one of the new emotions, anxiety, quite appropriately with Ozzy Osbourne's "Crazy Train" playing in the background of the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, honestly, like that, I'm really, really excited for uh, for Inside Out to. Oh, so am I. Yeah, because like, we've we've both shouted about how much we love uh, the first uh, uh, Inside Out. Yeah, so, it'll be really interesting to see what directions they take the sequel in. Uh, yeah, because this is this is definitely one of those films that definitely warranted having a sequel. I am I am concerned though the fact that we've got a fifth Toy Story film on the way. I'm I'm worried they're going to start milking. That. I'm worried they're starting to milk this franchise. <laughs> yeah, I yeah uh, I don't know. We'll 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 see. Yeah, but um, but. The thing with me having the thing with me having this King of Isolation, I'm contractually obligated to go and see the films anyway. So who knows? We might end up being presently su- pleasantly surprised like we were with Toy Story 4. Indeed. But we'll we'll see what happens when the film comes out anyway. Yes. So um So where about so uh, Yeah. So um so those so those um so that um so that uh the, the deeds of his um uh shipping fleet that I brought up a moment ago. Let, let's let's just get that back in. Boom. He uses that to he uses that as collateral and manages to get a ten thousand dollar bank loan to get his uh a museum uh up and running. Now I now I did a little bit of number crunching, folks. Well, well, not extensive number crunching. I just um, it was just just a classic Google search. What would uh, this amount of money be in today's money? And I also I also work, I also put in uh, what would it be at the time the film came out? So ten thousand uh, dollars in the eight in. So I just I just went with eighteen fifty just to be safe. Yes. Uh, and you're looking at somewhere in the region of just under four hundred thousand pounds in twenty twenty three money. Well, four hundred thousand dollars, I should say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, but in but in twenty seventeen money, it's still a it's still a very hefty amount three hundred and fourteen thousand dollars in twenty seventeen when the film came out. So still still a hefty loan to pay off. <laughs> uh, and um, but with all despite all the exhibits that he's got, it's not. That great a start. Only three tickets sold, and the tickets being with his family. So, 
we get a we get a subtle callback to the moment where um where this um where one of where one of the uh, uh oddities uh decided to give young Barnum uh, an apple um during um the million dream sequence uh what well, musical number I should say mm. um we get a subtle callback to that where he looks at the apple next to the book Tom Thumb and that's when he gets the idea of getting these oddities to create a show and oh boy this cast uh, the, the cast of Odysseys, where do we begin with these guys? Um, so we've got uh, Sam Humphrey as uh, Charles Stratton, uh, a dwarf performer known by his stage name, General Tom Thumb. This is the, fir- this is the first of his uh, uh, recruitments that he mm-hmm. makes. Um, now, uh, now, Charles, now, Charles, understandably, concerned that everybody's going to laugh at him. But a little bit of convincing from uh, Barnum, a general with the most beautiful uniform ever made, and when people come to see him, they won't laugh, they'll salute. And that, and that's, and that's all it takes to get him on board for the show. And then, and then we, get, and we get the music score timed with the... Um, uh, the hammer hits of getting these um, advertisement posters up. Uh, unique individuals. Uh, we get we get uh, conjoined twins. We get we get a man that's like literally covered in dog hair. We get like um, we get somebody that's really heavy. We get somebody that's really tall, and uh, a man covered in covered the entire body covered in tattoos. So a lot of oddities. Um, a lot of oddities here, so not sure on them, not sure on that uh, front. And then he he gets uh, a couple of trapeze artists who are actually siblings, uh, W. D. and Anne Wheeler. Now Anne is the Anne is the one I'm going to be focusing on as far as the cast is concerned. Although W. D. Wheeler is uh, uh, Yahya Abdul Mateen II. Uh, who's actually Anne's older uh, brother. Uh, but Anne herself, former Disney Channel star Zendaya. Now, she has a very extensive resume to begin with. Uh, and quite a successful one, not just in terms of awards, but also from, um, but also from uh, box office numbers in the case of some of the films that she's been involved in. Um, some of them include the Tom Holland Spider-Man trilogy. Uh, one of her most successful Disney Channel shows was Shake It Up alongside Bella Thorne. Uh, Dune managed to win uh, Best Original Score uh, that year at the um, at the Oscars, netting Hans Zimmer his second Oscar of his entire career and his first one since The Lion King, which came out in 1994. So that's quite an extensive gap between between two Oscar wins, but uh, still, test. But I mean, still, even with the lack of them um, Oscars to his name, there's still no denying that Hans Zimmer does have a very impressive resume in his forty plus year career. Oh yeah, like no matter how many Oscars he has, guy's a legend. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually gonna um, his. Um, He's had, a, he's had a show over the last uh, five years, A Symphonic Celebration, The World of Hans Zimmer, um, that said that show's just finished up, which means there's going to... But uh, fear not, folks, because there's going to be a new World of Hans Zimmer show coming out next year, a new dimension, which is going to include some of his uh, newer films, including Dune and potentially Top Gun Maverick, potentially. So we'll see what happens with that. And the show... That um, one of those shows is taking place in Glasgow on my birthday, no less, next year, folks. So I am <laughs> definitely going to be going to that. Quite right. Yeah, and uh, one of the other one of the other shows that I found out, uh, granted, it's not going to be until twenty twenty five, folks. 
but uh, Jeff Wayne's musical version of The War of the Worlds is going back on tour in 2025. And oh, I'm excited about that one as well, because that's now officially one of those uh, shows that is definitely on my watch list. I've heard so many good things about it. I've, I've even listened to uh, I've even listened to some of the soundtrack uh, as well. The iconic Forever Autumn, followed by the amazing Thunder Child, and just mm. uh, and what, what was what was that duet called? Uh, the, there's a duet in there, Spirit of Man, I think it is. I think it's Spirit of Man. I might be wrong on that one. Um, I said, I'm I'm certain it's Spirit of Man, but so, but either way, um, it's definitely a show I'm very very excited about. Uh, going to uh yeah uh the spirit of man that's not yeah 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 i was i was right yeah so yeah you know, so i was like so i'm really really excited about that one because i mean i mean i mean i mean just, I mean, just, just the main book it's, itself the war of the world is already iconic enough to begin with and then to have it adapted into a stage musical is whew, wow uh but uh less said about the uh tom cruise film the better uh, bu- 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 Zendaya, where are you? Yes, uh, uh, she's been in Dune, uh, Shake It Up, Tom Holland, Spider-Man, I've already mentioned that. Uh, she was in uh, the Space Jam sequel, A New Legacy, where she took over the role of um, uh, Lola Bunny, thankfully less sexualized folks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I am not apologizing for disappointing all the furry fans out there. You've opened up a can of worms there. <laughs> uh, yeah, and once that can's opened, it's very difficult to get it closed again. Uh, but but an, another one of her most successful roles is the Emmy Award-winning Euphoria. Now, she's actually won a couple of Emmys for that um, uh, for that show. And it's... Um, I, I've definitely heard it's... Uh, in some areas, it's a, it's a tough watch. Given the subject matter, but uh, I've, I've I've not actually got around to watching it yet. But uh, it's definitely one that's um, it's definitely one that's uh, up there, um, for me uh, for me to watch. Um, but um, then once we get once we get the uh, once we get all the uh, recruitment done, uh, and I think the last piece of the puzzle is uh, Letty Lutz. Who is a bearded lady, folks? Uh, but my word, the voice, the voice on this lady oh. is phenomenal. Fantastic. Uh, Kila Settle portrays Letty here, and all all the all these posters that you see of the uh, the people that Barnum has managed to recruit, and yeah, he's just like, yes, we have a show. And then Come Alive starts to come in. And, oh, yes. Just, <laughs> yes. Now, what was it I put in my notes regarding this one? Um, what was it I put in? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is where the film starts to pick up because, oh, we, we, get, we get to see all the costumes. that We get to see the costumes that they wear for, uh, for the shows. And the choreography throughout this is just, Chef kiss on the on the uh, on the uh, choreography, absolutely amazing. And and of course, there's a few nerves in the system from um, from uh, Barnum's cast, and understandably so. They're concerned how everybody else is going to react. Uh, I'll see if I can try and get the uh, rest of the crew up. Thanks to thanks to IMDb. Doodly doodly do and. Um, uh, costume. Aha! There we are. That's the name we need. Um, the costume designer for the for that. I've, I've, I've got to. I've got to shout out these these people for like putting together these incredible musical number sequences and just helping them stand out in so many ways. Uh, production designer Nathan um, uh, Crowley. Uh, the art direction uh, Laura. Uh, Ballinger. Now, I'm 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 trying to work out what, what what I'm trying to work out what is art direction again. Oh, uh, 
hang on, hang on. Oh, actually, actually, got it here. Um, art director is the title for a variety of similar job functions in theatre advertising. Yeah. Um, in, in, a design, tr- in a design project, yeah. art direction is the management of all aspects of the project. An art director is responsible for coordinating and supervising the work of designers, artists, and other creators who are working on the project at hand. So that so that will include everything that I'm just about to mention here from uh, from the production design, uh, set decoration. That will be one of those uh, things, and costume design as well. So that so that will cover that will cover those areas as well. Yeah. Um, uh, Debbie Shoot uh, is the set decorator for this one, and let's say the costume design, Ellen um, Mirojnik, absolutely phenomenal job. Yeah. On Magnif- those costumes, magnificent work, and and I and I don't I don't often shout out that uh, that particular side of the crew, folks, but it's it it's needed for a yes. film like this. Yes, one hundred percent. Like like if for something called the greatest showman, you want to put on the greatest show for every aspect, and and they do. absolutely, and and some of the and uh, and a couple of the co- and the main choreographer uh, for. Uh, which definitely helps these musical numbers uh, stand out in their own in their own unique way. Uh, Shannon Holtz, um, Shannon Holt Zapfel uh, is the main choreographer. You've got the one of her assistant co- choreographers, uh, Jenny uh, Griffin, um, as well. They they def their choreography definitely helps these. And uh, we're definitely going to need to cue uh, the uh, comedy rim shot here, folks. It their choreography helps these musical numbers come alive, if you will. And and one one of my one of my one of my favorite one of my favorite parts of this whole sequence, um, uh, as well as uh, seeing uh, General Tom Thumb just like shooting his gun in the air while he's riding that horse, um, is is seeing. Barnum's kids, seeing them dancing in the audience as well. It's oh, I love I love that moment. And just the roar and the applause, the ovation from the crowd. It's it's things like that that are why I love performing as much as I do, just yes. feeding off the energy of the crowd. Yes. yes. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, especially especially when I'm singing, uh, especially when I'm singing like uh, like the big tracks, like um, like whether it's for competitions or for karaoke purposes, like uh, like da- like Danger Zone, Top Gun. That's iconic enough to begin with. And then my signature piece, Bon Jovi, Wanted Dead or Alive. It's when that chorus kicks in, and I want it, and then everyone's going want it. <laughs> Just oh. especially especially when especially when the um, Especially when the performance area is packed and you just have everybody joining in, it's just, oh. Dare I say, I feel like Freddie Mercury in moments like that. I mean, I mean, Freddie Freddie Mercury, he was a showman in his own right to begin with. Yeah, just, yes. I mean, how many people do you know that can engage the crowd the way he did? Yeah, very few. Exactly. That's and that's and that's one of the reasons why we're never going to see the likes of Freddie Mercury ever again. Some might, some might come close. Yes, but uh, I was like, I mean, one one of the, one of the things I asked myself with everything coming together with the choreography, the costumes, and especially with the uh, the visuals, I wondered how much did they spend from that $84 million budget that they had, how much of that was spent just on the visual effects for this film? A, f- I was, a fair I, bit, I'd say. I, I, I would, yeah, I'd say def- definitely, a, definitely a fair chunk of change uh, from that, because it, 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 it is definitely money well spent, be it, be it practically or through a bit of CG in there. But the CG is not too obvious uh, if there if there is any cg in there yes 
and that's the best way to, to use it sparingly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and and one of the, and one of the uh, one of the critics that often comes to Bond shows, uh, James Gordon Bennett. Um, one of one of the reviews that Barnum reads in the uh, in the papers, uh, Bennett compares the show. Uh, he calls the show a circus, and he actually and uh, Barnum actually likes that somehow. Is he he manages to use that, and it changes to P.T. Barnum's circus, and the rest, as they say, is history. Yep, hence, hence the expression: any publicity is good publicity. Yes, and I'm fairly, I'm fairly sure they do. I'm fairly sure they do quote that line at some point in this film as well. I believe. I'm fairly sure they do. Uh, but um, but it is, it is, a, it is a shame that a few months before the film came out, though, that the uh, the, the Barnum and Bailey Circus did close down in early 2017, uh, partly because of um, declining attendance. And the um, the growing criticism towards uh, the mistreatment of animals, um, which, and and that, and that's one of the reasons, and that's one of the main reasons why when you go to these um, when you go to these uh, circuses that pop up um, uh, where wherever you are in the um, wherever they are in your area, uh, and and uh, as, as, as well as one of the um, uh, Blackpool Tower. Uh, as, uh, like Blackpool Tower being one of them, because uh, um, same same year the film came out, no less, folks. Um, I spent uh, a week, uh, well, I say a week it was Monday through to Friday, um, in Blackpool, and it was it was it was it was an amazing experience being able to go to um, being able to go to the Black Blackpool Tower dungeon, uh, Pleasure Beach, uh, Madame Two Swords, uh, and and go and going to the uh, Blackpool Tower Circus as well. Um, that's that's why you don't see uh, any like uh, animal uh, performances anymore because of all the um, uh, growing criticism towards um, the people criticizing the mistreatment of um, uh, the animals, mm. which 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 you can understand because yes, but say but it's, it's still, but still even then still doesn't detract from the fact that um, when you when you see those uh, high risk stunts. Um, uh, taking place at the um, at these uh, circus shows, there's still there's still a sight to behold to be, um, in the in itself. Yes, just that you know times change and sensibilities change. Absolutely, yeah. And and uh, what what are, what are the other what are the other things that um uh, one of the other things that I brought up in the um uh, in my notes here is that this is one of those films that definitely needed. To be seen on the big screen to get that yes. full, to get that full showman experience. Yeah, this really was a cinematic experience. Yeah, abs absolutely. So much so that I actually went to see it three times during its run. Uh, once by myself on release day because it released on Boxing Day here in the UK. Even though the premiere itself was on the RMS Queen Mary two on December eighth that year. And then it premiered in, and then it released in the US on December twentieth, six days before uh, it got its uh, UK release. Uh, so that was the first time I went to see it. Then I went to see it with one of my um, close friends a few weeks later, and then with the with how popular the um, with how popular with how much popularity the film had gained, it was inevitable. That they were going to start doing sing-along screenings, so that was my so that was my third uh, that was my third screening of that film, and oh, it was it was mm, yeah, and I, and uh, I've never actually been to um, one of those screenings. I'd like to someday. The closest um, I've come to is when uh, um, one of the times I went to see Bohemian Rhapsody, um, some of the mm. audience members were singing along. Ah yes, but, oh. but I've never been to an official sing along thing. Yeah, I'd like to someday though. Yeah, that's 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 and um, which actually which actually brings me on to um 
another time that I went to, uh, that I that I saw the film, and this is and this is after the film came out on home media, folks. Um, because uh, I'm trying to work this out here. 2018 came out on home media. Um, I was at uh, I was at a weekend event in Sheffield, and it was t- and uh, a majority of the weekend took place at the Sheffield University campus. Uh, they actually had a they actually had a theater they actually had like um like a a, a movie theater on, on on the campus and they showed the greatest showman and they had and they had and they had it switched to the uh, sing along version so that all the lyrics from the songs there uh, came up and everybody was having an absolute blast with this film and <laughs> uh, uh, none, none more so than myself because i've all, I've always seen myself i've I've, I, might, I might have brought up a, f- a couple of times previously. I've seen myself as a bit of a showman myself because, uh, I mean, because like I said, I love performing. I love feeding off the energy of the crowd. One of my favorite moments uh, was with um, was with Jack, and uh, we'll get we'll get into we'll get into that particular song, and you guys know exactly what one we're going to be on about in just a moment. That that but that was easily the highlight because it definitely felt like we were in a way recreating that particular moment in the film which we are just about to get into um there's because there are there are a few um there are a couple of quotes that um uh, charity says that uh that are still um uh, relevant uh today and then the um, and then uh, the last of the uh, the last of the big names in this uh, uh, in the cast I've got folks is uh, Zach Efron who plays Philip Carlyle here. Now he's no stranger to being involved in film musicals because he's been in the High School Musical trilogy. He's been in Hairspray um, as well. And interestingly, uh, one of the things that um. One of the things I found out that uh, sort of like partly because of the fact that you've got like several actors in this cast involved in this particular series or franchise, um, the fact that Yaya and Zach were in the 2017 film adaptation of Baywatch, and we all know how iconic the TV series is to begin with, Hasselhoff, Anderson, you know. <laughs> um, but Michelle Williams actually made, uh, actually was in the TV series of Baywatch. So there you go, folks. And uh, and I was actually pleasantly surprised when um, I was just I was just um, looking for like uh, this was this was one of those nights where I was just looking for something to watch slash something to have on in the background while I get my editing done for these uh, for these episodes. And lo and behold, on ITVX, folks, in the UK, the original Baywatch series is on ITVX, folks. So, yeah. so I was like, yeah, let's put this on. And oh, that theme, that theme song still iconic to this day. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, that was part of like the best time period for ITV for Saturday nights. Because you would start off on the BBC with Grandstand and the Generation Game and then switch over to ITV. For Baywatch, Gladiators, and Blind Date, and that was, and that was, and that was your sat, and that was every Saturday, folks. It's, um, I say, I say, and, uh, and on the subject, of Gladiators, folks, uh, the new series is fast approaching. It's going to be on the BBC this time around, but they've they've updated the original logo while keeping some like nostalgic elements from it, uh, the original logo. And they kept the original theme as well. So, and and the reason that, the reason I'm really excited about this is the fact that I my, I actually got to go to one of the TV tapings back in June of this year for when they were recording the the, the new series in Sheffield, and oh, it was such an amazing atmosphere. Being part of being part of the crowd for one of the one of the best shows that one of the best. Um, sports entertainment shows um, that's ever been that's ever been made, and uh, so like I said, I am really really excited about uh, the um, 
about the new series starting soon. And should it get another should it get another series um once this first series is out of the way? Should it get another series? I'm going to be applying to be a contender for the next series, folks. So, hey, nice. who knows? You could end up, uh, for those in the UK anyway, you could end up seeing me on the BBC uh, as a contender, potentially. Shoot for, <laughs> shoot for the moon. And if you miss, you'll land amongst the stars, as they say. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I say, even, if, even if I don't get on the show, at least I applied and gave it a go. Yes. Because you'd regret it if you didn't at least go for it. Absolutely. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take, as Michael Jordan once put it. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so some of the, a couple of the other projects that Zach Efron was um, uh, involved in, I've already brought up Baywatch, High School Musicals, but I've brought them up. Uh, he was also in uh, 17 again. And I was a little hesitant about bringing that particular film up because it does also star the late Matthew Perry, who we all know as Chandler from Bear for Friends. Rest in peace, rest in peace, Matthew. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, but I, I mean, to, but then I thought to not bring it up would be a bit of an, a bit of an injustice to, um, uh, yes, to what, to what Matthew Perry's done. Yes. So, um, so Carlisle is very much reluctant to run away from home and join the circus. Uh, he, that is what he says, he, uh, run away and join the circus. And then we get into one of my fi- one of my top three songs in this film. It's uh, a great but, one. Yeah, The Other Side. And this is where me, this is where that moment with me and Jack in Sheffield comes into play him being carlisle me being bottom and everybody else was joining in in that moment as well and oh it was oh just <laughs> it, it's it, it's hard it's hard to it's hard to go into great detail with that performance without uh, without just getting all nostalgic about it but you know, see, this this is one of this is one of those cases where i would honestly love to be able to recreate this scene at some point like like have like have the bar have those shot glasses uh have so, have somebody who's the barman um me and me and somebody else taking the roles of carlisle and then um, barnum doing doing the choreography potentially as well and just 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 hitting those notes and then, and then the challenging part would be getting those uh, getting those harmonies towards the end of the song. But I'm fairly sure, uh, I'm fairly sure a vocal coach will definitely um, mm. they'll definitely be able to help us with them um, yeah. with that. There's, one. there's an interesting thing about this scene. Um, yeah. There's a there's a line which was heavily featured in the trailers for this movie for this scene that was not in the movie itself. Um, it's Barnum not the said, first time. It's not the first time things like it's not the first time things like that have happened where you have, where you have a trailer that involves a line or a scene that doesn't end up being in the final product. It's not the yeah. first time that's happened. Yeah, sometimes there are even lines which are created specifically for the trailer. In this particular case, um, Barnum says that Carlisle has a um, flair for show business, to which Carlisle remarks that he doesn't know what show business is, and Barnum responds. Because I just invented it. Yes, yeah, I, I know, I know the line you're on about now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, I say that's 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 a that's a surprise that that particular that particular line didn't feature in in the film itself. Yeah, which makes me wonder: Did they just create that for the trailer? Because I mean, I I, if... I I think that I think that might be the case. The fact that they that they did record that scene. Uh, what what what? Uh, one particular take of that scene, and they used that take for the trailer. Yeah, and they and they used a different take entirely for the film itself. Mm. Shame it wasn't in the final movie, but hey, what can you do? Well, I said, well, I said, well, whoever, whoever the whoever the uh, the main editor of the film, uh, whoever the main uh, editor of the film was, um, I feel. You might have done a bit of a, a bit of an injustice 
regarding uh, regarding that. Oh, right. Ah, here we are. There's the editing team. Tom Cross, Robert Duffy, uh, Joe Hutching, Michael McCusker, John uh, John Paul, and Spencer Sousa. You 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 guys might have done a bit of an in, uh, a bit of an injustice not including that line in the uh, in the trailer, but still six actors. Yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily go as far as to say injustice. Maybe that line was just part of a sequence in the scene which maybe affected the pacing a bit. Maybe that that little moment was good. Maybe the thing around it was just interfering with the scene because sometimes yeah. you know that can happen. Um, Understandable, yeah. I mean, we still, you know, have a record of it in the trailer, so better than nothing, I suppose. That's that's true. Yes, that is absolutely true. Yeah. Um, so, so, so going back, going back to the costumes uh, for when, uh, when we get to the end of this, um, when we get to the end of this, because um, it's it's when uh, it's just it's it's just, it's just just it's just the way it starts building when Barnum actually manages to start convincing Carlisle to work alongside him and then uh, so you, you get this you get this back and forth uh, how uh, how much of how much is uh, Carlisle going to be getting from the show um what percentage of the show would i be taking uh Barnum starts at 7 and is um <laughs> and, Car- and Carlisle's just like uh, yeah no uh let goes straight up to 18 and then and then, and then Barnum's just like why not just go ahead and that's the nickels on the dime and then, and then, and then, and then they start getting closer and cl- and then, this this is this is a great piece of editing here. So you're just getting close. They're getting closer and closer in the same way their numbers are getting closer and closer to each other. Just zooming in, and then and then they finish at ten. You've got the short glasses on the bar, and Barnum's just like, um, and, and the barman's just like, um, where's my payment? And Barnum's is like, uh, right, oh, hey, have I got anything left? And Carlisle just boom, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and then just Carlisle, Sir, looks like you have yourself like a junior partner. 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 Barnum, what I have is I an overcompensated apprentice. Overcompensated just... apprentice. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. And as and then just it's it's amazing how they managed to somehow get the shot glasses into the choreography for this scene. As well, mm-hmm. and it's 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 brilliant. Yeah, uh, it's a fantastically crafted scene. Oh, absolutely, and uh, th- and that and that's uh, and that's all thanks to the uh, cinema cinematography, thanks to uh, Seamus McGarvey uh, mm-hmm. for provide for providing the uh, for doing the cinematography uh, throughout this film. Massive, I was like, like I said, I I don't often go into that much detail regarding like the the other behind the scenes. Um, crew because normally it's just the directors the writers the cast the music yeah and and that, and that's and that's just about it from uh, from what i cover from what i cover but again much like what i brought up with come alive this is this is one of those songs that definitely warrants crediting the other uh the other significant roles yeah in the um yeah in, if, in the crew if nothing else this movie really demonstrates the importance of the entire crew everyone involved in the making of a film Absolutely, all fifteen thousand jobs that were, um, all fifteen thousand jobs that were, um, uh, that were filled during the entire process of making this film. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's a lot more people than you think when it comes to getting these sort of films uh, put together. Yes, and then. And then once, and then once this, once this amazing sequence uh, finishes, so like I said, I, I, it's, you know, like I said, it's just amazing how they managed to get the shot glasses into the into the choreography for this for this sequence as well. Let's say, let's, um, uh, Carlisle sings sings a line, Bottom takes a drink, and then vice versa. And then they finish they finish they finish their shot glasses, and then they transition straight into straight into backstage at the circus and i i can't that's an amazing transition folks from being at the bar to being backstage at the circus absolutely incredible transition there so 
And then we and then we get a small hint of rewrite the stars as we have that slow motion shot of Anne looking into the eyes of of um of Carlisle while she's doing her trapeze act. And now that would normally be distracting at the best of times, but the fact that she maintains professionalism and maintains the focus for something as high risk as being a trapeze artist, testament to how good she is as a performer. Mm -hmm. And the thing, the thing that amazes me with this next sequence is the fact that Philip Carlyle, after some reviews get, um, uh, after the next review gets um, published, uh, and it's 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 Letty's response that's Friendship just and it's just like Bennett, sarcastic comedic gold here. Um, offensive and indecent. Oh, Mister Bennett, I am blushing. <laughs> oh, absolutely brilliant. But say, but but say. I am trying to fathom how they managed, how Phil Carlyle managed to get an audience with Queen Victoria. I'm trying to fathom how he managed that. Must have friends in high places. Must must be. And uh, and he even says if if you want to be if you want to be uh, respected by everybody, might well start at the very top. And and, th and then Anne questions if everybody is going to get to go to see Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace in London, folks. Um, and then Carlisle simply says, I'll just have to tell her that either all of us go or none of us will. And <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm fairly sure this exchange between... Charles and Victoria. I'm fairly sure this is definitely some form of innuendo. I'm fairly sure this is a some sort of innuendo between these two. Um, uh, it's it's when uh, it's when Charles says uh, you're not exactly reaching uh, the top shelf yourself, <laughs> and and I'm just well, it's it's just the it's just the audible gasp from everybody. And then Victoria just bursts out laughing. That's a, that's a, like I said, like I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure. I'm fairly sure that's some sort of uh, innuendo in there. I might be wrong. If it is, folks, let us know in the comments. Fairly sure it is. Um, I don't think so. I think that's just, you know, a, a comment saying, well, you know, like, talking about height, that's rich coming from you. We'll go. We'll go with. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. I mean, I could be wrong, I, but I mean, if if there is a double meaning to that, then yeah, like by all means, point it out. <laughs> yeah, as I, as I like, as I, like I said, if it is, if it does end up being an innuendo, folks, a uh, double entendre, let us know in the comments. So after after the um, after the entourage of um, uh, greeted Queen Victoria with um, with their presence. We then get Jenny Lind, who is portrayed by Rebecca Ferguson here. Now, much like Zendaya, she was also part. Uh, she was also in Dune, but she was also in Mission. She's also been part of the Mission Impossible uh, franchise, and um, a little hidden British gem, the kid who would be king, based around the uh, based around the uh, King Arthur legend. But they managed to modernize it, and the and they have a majority of it set around this British school. So, so like I said, it, it's it's a hidden little British gem if you haven't had a chance to check it out, folks. It's uh, I, I I thoroughly enjoyed it when it came out. Mm. Now, uh, there's there are a couple of um, historical inaccuracies here that uh, yes, it I mean it was I mean. It was inevitable I was going to bring these up, folks, but <laughs> um, but um, but so this one's more this one's more of a this one's more of a glaring inaccuracy, and one of the other ones is understandable why they would change it. Mm. Um, the thing, the 
uh, Jenny Lind is often touted as the Swedish Nightingale, which would mean which would then mean Jenny Lind had a soprano voice. But when we hear Jenny Lind singing in the film, her voice is more alto than anything else. So there's inaccuracy number one. And inaccuracy number two, the actual P.T. Barnum wasn't exactly a very nice person to work with. Yeah. So, and I mean, and, yep. Well, I was going to say, like, the... I, I can understand people being, you know, turned off by the historical and, like, character inaccuracies in this. But at the same time, you know, this isn't meant to be an exact biopic about P.T. Barnum. It is just a show about him, if you know what I mean. Exactly. exactly. That's, that's, that, that's what this is. It's a show about how P.T. Barnum created showbiz, if you will. Yes. So, you know, like, I can kind of let a lot of the inaccuracies like that slide just because, you know, because of what the film wants to be and what it needs to be. Yeah. So, so there is so, um, so the couple, there's a couple of things that were actually omitted from the film, uh, omitted from the movie because of its link to slavery is P.T. Barnum's first attraction and initial incursion into show business, uh, Joyce Heth, an African-American woman who Barnum bought in 1835 from a plantation in Kentucky. Elderly and blind, she was presented by Barnum as the 161-year-old nurse of George Washington. Playing her role to the letter, Joyce would sing lullabies, uh, uh, tell anecdotes, is that how it's pronounced? Anecdotes, uh, yes. Yes, uh, tell anecdotes about Washington and other stories, all invented by Barnum. A year into the tour, Joyce died and Barnum sold her body to a New York City surgeon who wanted to perform an autopsy with the condition um, with the condition for the event to be public so Barnum could sell tickets. Over 1,500 people assisted when the surgeon determined Joyce was really around 80 years old and Barnum claimed that Joyce was still alive and that the person in the autopsy was someone else. It was only after this event that Barnum started his museum. And although the film portrays P.T. Barnum as a champion of racial inequality, um, as I, that this, this, actually ties into, this actually ties into the previous point. Although the film portrays P.T. Barnum as a champion of racial equality. His record on the subject was decidedly mixed. Uh, however, in his later career as a politician, he campaigned ardently for the, uh, the abolition of slavery, swapping from the Democrats to the Republican Party, declaring a human soul that God has created and Christ died for is not to be trifled with. It may tenant the body of a of a Chinaman, a Turk, an Arab, or a Hottentot, it is still an immortal spirit. So that's um that's that's definitely that's definitely um an intriguing part of um uh Barnum's actual uh, uh yes. his history, yeah. And and speaking of history, there was actually an idea in the early 80s by John Landis to do a film about P.T. Barnum. And he yes. and he would have shown Barnum as, um, you know, a showman, but also a businessman and a charlatan. But, you know, it's a little bit difficult to set that to musical numbers. Yeah. <laughs> So again, you know, like, you know, because of what this film is wanting to be, like, whether like whether you agree or disagree with it, it's kind of, you know, understandable, like, in a way, simplifying Barnum's story. You know, not saying it's necessarily right a lot of the time, but, you know, you can get why. Yeah. Is it now, interestingly, there was, um, although, although we wouldn't get... 
that particular film version, there was actually a musical entitled Barnum that played at the St. James's Theatre on Broadway between April 1980 and May 1982. And two members of interesting this this is the this is an interesting part here. Two members of the original Broadway cast are background actors in this film. Those two people in question being Marianne Tatum, who played Jenny Lind in the Barnum musical, and Leonard Cro- um, uh, Crawford, um, who played Tom Thumb. So that's so that's um, that's interesting that. They, they had a stage musical in the 80s and you had two of those cast members as background actors in this film. So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, now, what are the, now, what are the interesting things regarding uh, this next song, Never Enough? Um Rebecca Ferguson's voice was actually dubbed by um, Lauren Alred. And Ferguson had studied music and admitted that she can carry a tune. But since Jenny Lind, her character, is considered to be considered the best singer in the world, dubbing her voice would be in service of the movie. However, in order to get into the role, Ferguson insisted on singing the song in front of the extras while filming. So... Ferguson singing the song um, in front of the extras and then having Lauren's Lauren's voice dubbed over it is, um, I mean, I I agree. I, I, I agree with that. I agree with Rebecca on this one that having that, having the voice dub definitely, um, definitely worked in the film's favor here because Lauren's, Lauren's vocals Throughout this, throughout this song, I, I I actually I actually called I actually called this uh, in my notes, and I actually called this song a true showstopper. The yes. fact that it's just the music and her vocals, and an, another another clever little piece of um, another cl- clever little piece of their uh, editing here is you see Carlisle. And um, 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 Carlisle and Anne's hands start to edge closer together before before they actually hold each other's hands at the point where the line goes, these hands can hold the world. Mm. And that's, I, thought, I was like, that is really, really clever. Yes, yeah, like, very. I was like, I was like yeah. I was like, because, because, even before they actually hold each other's hands, just just like the subtle hand movements, you can actually tell that there's actually a, a connection between these two that's going to be established into developing into a relationship between these two. Just those subtle hand movements is just brilliant, mm-hmm. and as well as um, as a, yeah, I, I even I even put in I, I just put it in here editing genius. Yes, in in that moment, and as and and much like, much like the end of uh, Come Alive, just the roar from the crowd and the standing ovation that Jenny Lynn gets at the end is incredible, mm. spellbinding, if you will. And and it's and it's from here. It's all been happy-go-lucky, everything's going great, but it's inevitable that things are going to start going south. And that's what happens here, because Barnum still resents Charity's dad, if you will. Um, and then, and then you actually start to see tension between uh, Barnum and Charity uh, start to develop. At this point, um, and and he actually and he actually shuts the rest of he actually shuts the uh, circus cast out because uh, he he wants them to be ready to go for uh, their next show later on that evening, and then we get oh. 
it's now time for the film's anthem. It's now time for the film's anthem, folks. This is me. Being unapologetic about who you are and not being afraid to show it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I say, like I say, this is and this is like I say, this is the film's anthem. And it's it's not hard to see why. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and, and you can you can see why this is what convinced the studio to go with the film and why it is so iconic. Yeah. And the fact that and the fact that rightly so, they use it in the trailers. Yes. Is it's it's not the first it's not the first time they've done this uh because a lot of because a lot of films they do release the soundtrack for the film like a week or so before the film actually comes out uh because quite a few of the tracks had somewhere in the region of between three to four hundred just individual tracks mixed together to make one final product for the song and it's it's crazy how many like individual tracks like uh, a track for the drums a track for the strings a track for one vocal a track for another set of vocals a track for the harmonies the number of the number of individual music tracks just to mix them all together to create that finished product that we see I admire the dedication of the music team for yes. getting these amazing showpieces as strong as they can be. Yes. And was it in was in the um, was it early on we saw some uh, we saw some protests happening uh, outside the circus. Uh we st- we still see we still see those protests uh, happening and th- and the circus cast they're just approaching they're approaching these protesters unafraid you 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 want us out of here bring it on and i say th- this is this is this is another this is another case of amazing um choreography especially especially that one moment um when where because they just, just, just the feet stomping in time for the music, and then just boom, arms down. <sighs> Such a powerful moment, and, oh, it's, yeah. and especially when, especially that shot of just Anne just looking up at um, at Philip Carlyle in that in that moment. Just so again, another ovation worthy moment. Yes. Has has it? I mean, has has anybody got anything to stop me from crashing the thesaurus? Because I'm struggling to I'm struggling to find other ways of describing how amazing this film is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so because I like I like I I even I even said at the end of that song, standing ovation, well deserved. Yeah, it's, in that moment, it's a good you know motivational song as well. It, Really yes. gets you, really gets you pumped. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wouldn't be too surprised if there's uh, if there's people out there that that have this in their in their gym playlist. Probably, and yeah. and understandably so. Yeah. So. So, Barnum now is going to be heading on tour with with Jenny Lind, um, and he's trying he's trying to get like. Um, He's trying to get like the cheapest musicians to try and maximize uh, the profit he's going to be making um, on this tour. Now, let's say, and, and that does, and that does hint at some of the um, con man elements that we um, that we get hinted at uh, in the early in the early part of the film. But yes. you can't you can't deny though, Bottom knows how to business. Yes. And so, so, so once Barnum uh, heads off, well, he's, once Barnum's in the final stages of preparing for heading on tour with Jenny, um, Anne and Carlisle, they, um, 
they they end up going on a they end up going on on, on a theatre date where yeah, a little bit of friction between Carlisle and his parents, which causes Anne to just to just walk away because she she doesn't want to get involved. And in a way, I don't blame her for wanting to get involved in the uh, in the family drug. Mm-hmm. But then, I've I've, I've I've touted about how much I love the other side. This is me. Fantastic anthem. But this is actually my personal favorite song of the entire soundtrack next. Rewrite the Stars. And I'll say this. Yeah, it's been 10 years since uh, Zach's been in been Troy Bolton in High School Musical, but he's, he's still got those singing chops. And those, this, his singing really has matured since his days as Troy Bolton. I mean, I mean, that, that, that's how I see it anyway, folks. Uh, you guys might yeah. see it differently. No, no, that's fair. Yeah. Then, then, this is the, um, one of the things that amazes me with this whole, with this whole scene, I mean, I mean Zendaya, she's, she's, uh, she's got a great singing voice on her as well. But the thing that amazes me is that all those stunts that you see her performing in this scene, a lot of them she actually did herself, which, again, testament to how amazing a performer Zendaya is. Yeah, she's marvelous. Yeah, because and 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 to and to think that the same year she was MJ in the first of the Tom Holland Spider Man trilogy, she went from that to producing this. And I think I think that's testament to how diverse her range of acting can be when you give her the right project to work with. Yes. And I was like, uh, "Rewrite the Stars" is I say, uh, another reason it's one of my favorite songs. It's my favorite song from the film. Is the fact that when when I have the right duet partner to work with on this one the harmonies chef kiss on those harmonies because mm-hmm. it's it's not the first time it's happened and i doubt it will be the last but i often i often get like just ooh, just mm, cinematic chills in the best way possible whenever i hear harmonies just hit yes. that right spot yes yeah and I brought I brought this up when um, when I went to see the Aladdin live action remake a, a couple of years later because um, one of the new songs that was written for the remake Speechless um, Benj and uh, Benj and Justin they wrote the new songs like right? they wrote the new songs and lyrics for the the Aladdin remake. And one of those songs was speechless. And when I first heard it start to play in the f- in the film, I was like, "Hang on, I'm getting hints of Greatest Showman about this about this particular <laughs> song." And and when I and then when I um and then when I got back home and I looked at the um I looked at who did the music, I was like, "I I I that's why there was Greatest Showman vibes about speechless." Because it because it had these guys involved in it, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but yeah, rest assured, folks. I rest assured, folks. I will eventually get round to the live action remakes. But for now, yes. The main the main goals are to get the rest of the animated classics lineup done, get the rest of the Pixar films done, and then head into the territory of the Disney Tune Studios films. Otherwise known as the forbidden territory of the director video sequels. <laughs> oh, that 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 that, <laughs> that reaction still gets me every time. <laughs> it's just like, oh no, not the director video sequels. Anything but the director video sequels. <laughs> but 
for all their faults, there are a few good ones in there. Yes. Yeah, definitely. You, you, you just have to tr- you just have to get through the uh, the bad ones to get to the good ones. Yes. But we'll worry about those director video sequels another day. Yes. So it's not too long before we get into the uh, the next song uh, of the film, and this is where Mich- and this is where Michelle Williams' vocals come into play here. There is a lot. There's a there's a fair amount of emotional weight in this. Uh, in this song, Tightrope. And this is where you see Barnum heading off on tour with Jenny Lind and seeing seeing one of the kids doing their ballet performing and it's just her sister and Charity in, in, the, in the audience and an empty seat where Barnum would be sitting if you wanted yeah. on tour with Jenny. It's, Maybe that's just a me thing, but that's always a powerful image to me. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've always, yeah. I, I agree with you on that one. I've always found something. I've always found moments like that being uh, powerful. As I mean, even, even when, even when they're at the dinner, just, are just frolicking with each other, and then you just have that empty seat, the head of the table where Barnum yeah. would be sitting. Yeah, the, there's something about you know in a movie when. Um, Something's happening, be it a show or a game or whatever, and you know, just look and see like a family or friends or whatever sitting there, and there's just that one empty seat. Something about that empty seat always just makes me go, oh, yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I've even seen, um, I've, I've actually, I've actually just remembered now you mentioned that, uh, that I've actually seen a couple of, um, a c- couple of, um, uh, adverts regarding mental health and it's centered around um it's centered around um somebody going to a football game and uh and everybody cheering uh, like just reacting to the game and and they're just sitting there just like, looking and feeling uh, pretty miserable with themselves and then you've got somebody sitting next to them talking to them making sure they're okay and then at the end of it the empty chair next to that fan because they because they had uh, they taken their own because the fan next okay. to him taking their own life because even though even though things look okay on the exterior you don't know what battles people are fighting on the ins uh, fighting internally yes yeah it's, um, it's, I, I, I actually, I actually brought up in um, in a previous King of Isolation episode. Uh, I can't remember which one it was. Oh, it was uh, it was Big Hero Six when um, it was after um, uh, uh, Tadashi had died in the um, in that explosion at the uh, university. Uh, that that grief can affect you quite significantly. Be it uh, physically, mentally, or in some cases both, and I, I, I brought up at that point. I don't often go into uh, themes as mature as that. Yes, but 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 I felt I felt it was definitely warranted uh, and needed, given where, uh, given the particular scene of the film that I was at at that point, because I am um, because I br- I brought up. I brought up at that moment as well. I'm going to bring it up here as well. There was actually a point where I actually cons- where I actually considered no longer being here, and it's not very often I it's not very often I hit that point, folks. But thankfully, reaching out to everybody, uh, reaching out to uh, the gym that I go to, and the although although the although they were, although I did get criticized for uh scaring them quite a bit uh, on on that particular night um which yeah I, yeah me maybe just maybe just dm them on messenger rather than scaring the entire gym in future but, but so like but like I say that, that so that I say hindsight's a, hindsight's a wonderful thing but um, yes 
but um, but I've had granted a bit of tough love over the last uh, over the last couple of weeks from uh, one of the coaches there, but again warranted because I've not because I hadn't been consistent with my training. I hadn't been looking after myself properly. Here I am, nearly two. Here I am, nearly two weeks in since that since that moment, um, where where the tough love was just like showered upon me. Again, ne- again, definitely needed. Two weeks, two weeks in, and I'm already feeling better within myself uh, now that I've got that routine in place. Getting Good. up, getting up, breakfast, um, getting myself ready, and then off to the gym to start the day. Good. So, uh, so I mentioned after uh, Never Enough had finished, I mentioned things started to go south. Things hit their breaking points between Barnum and uh, Jenny. And then you get this emotional reprise of um, of Never Enough. And, you, and, uh, as a, and if you actually pay attention to one of the shots, you can actually see you can actually see a tear start to roll down um, Jenny's face um, uh, in that in that moment, and um, so the fact that so the fact that uh, Barnum's concerned that if if Jenny stops the tour, that it'll ruin him. Which does see him come across as a bit selfish in that in that moment that he's thinking about himself um, rather than rather than thinking about what Jenny wanted at the same time. And I think just just the emotional weight of singing that never enough reprise uh, it definitely ties into this moment really really well, and then. I said I said it reached their breaking point, and then the final blow, the f- flash photography, when Jenny kisses Barnum, and he questions what what was that, and she simply said that was goodbye, and she just walks away, and we find out that she actually quit later on, and this allows Barnum to come back home early. But mm, not in the way he would have wanted, because uh, while he's been away, while he's on his way back, Carlisle is dealing with some of the protesters that decided to come to the show. And then the rest of the circus cast decide to come in to provide some assistance just just letty just yelling charge in that moment reinforcements have arrived all hell breaks loose and it culminates with one of those thugs as bennett puts it later taking one of those lanterns and just throwing it against the wall starting a massive fire and the drama hits 11 quite quickly here. As Barnum gets back, happy to see his family again, fire, uh, fire carriages, because you can't exactly call them fire trucks back in the 1800s. Yes. But, but, but fire carriages, they try to put out the fire. Um. Everybody's everybody's out apart from Anne. Carlisle goes into the burning building to try and get her. And at that same moment, Wheeler, Anne is coming round the other side. And, and everybody's like, oh, this is not going to end well. <laughs> and a couple of my friends who grew up with High School Musical, they went to see it just because it was Zac Efron was in it. They were just, they legitimately said to me, heart, the heart was heart in their mouth moments, and understandably so. So 
what does Barnum decide to go and do? He decides to go into the building to get Carlisle out. And like a split second later, you hear the building start to grow and then collapse under the weight of the fire. And that, it's a classic moment. It's a classic case of, oh my word, please be okay. Yes. And thankfully, they're both okay, albeit Carlisle did inhale a lot of smoke, so off to the hospital he goes. And it's... And then reality hits home that Barnum is... Barnum thinks he's Barnum thinks he can try and use some of the um, the profits from Jenny's tour to try and rebuild the circus, and that's when Bennett shows the paper, Jenny quits, Barnum scandal, and yeah, not a single bank in New York, let alone the entire country, is gonna be loaning Barnum any more money anytime soon. But so and then it's it's it's, it's another classic trope. You get the you get the uh, you get the protagonist feeling miserable about themselves, most likely at a bar, case in point here. Uh and then gets gets a bit of a a pep talk from from the others. And W.D. Wheeler, very stern and authoritative in this moment, that they want their home back. And then we get, from now on, another, another personal favorite of mine from this soundtrack. Just the slow build and Barnum reflecting on everything he had experienced up to this point and in that moment but those were someone else's dreams the pitfalls of the man i became tying into the fact that he had complete that he had sort of like missed the point of why he did all of this to begin with and then when he's holding that photo frame of him with his family outside the museum early on in the film. But when I stop and see you there, I remember who all this was for. And then everyone just, this is another case of fantastic choreography. People on social media have recreated the choreography. Um, as they've, as they, and, and one of, and one of the, one of the people that I've actually recreated was actually one of the, um, one of the uh, one of the extra dancers from the from the film they actually were part of the uh, the dancing ex part of the dancing team in this film and they got to recreate this choreography on on their social media platforms and it's i honestly i honestly love it just, everybody just sharing drinks enjoying each other's company and just what else what else what else can you say it gets you in the feels absolutely couldn't agree more with that and when letty gives barnum his hat and he's and she's just like you've got a family to get back to so sprints out the bar gets the train back to where um charity um charity's parents are he's told that she's not there and then his kids come running in saying they know where she is and then the two reconcile with a small reprise of from now on and a little bit of a million dreams in there um as well because it goes um uh, let this promise in me start like an anthem in my heart. And then Michelle, however big, however small. Just, and the music score at this point is 
simply beautiful, complete net reconciliation between the two. So, <laughs> uh, Barnum apologizes to his entourage about uh, disappointing them, and he's and uh, uh, General Thomas is like, we've gotten used to it by this point. <laughs> I mean, whoever, let's see, let's see the casting. Casting was uh, Tiffany Little Canfield and Bernard uh, Telsey, uh, as well as the writers, uh, writers of the screenplay, uh, Jenny Bix and Bill uh, Condon. Uh, now, Bill Condon, I believe, has also, I believe he also did another film. Uh, that's, yes, yes, he did. Uh, Bill Condon was also... Um, Director for the Beauty and the Beast remake that uh, that came out that uh, that came out the same year, and um, a lot of people have touted that the Beauty and the Beast remake is the best one that Disney have done uh, so far. Um, let's say so. Uh, so so Jenny Jenny Bix and Bill Condon they. They did the uh, the screenplay. Jenny also did the story, and then you've got the casting, and then you've got the casting directors, uh, Tiffany and Bernard. Um, I mean, ma mass massive props to them for it. Because like, I've I've got to praise them for that particular moment because uh, it's it's sort of like a sort of like a, a small dig at Barnum, but uh, in a, in a in a comedic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and then. And then, and then Carlisle, he's managed to recover from the um, uh, the the fire tr uh, the fire drama that we dealt with earlier. Um, and then they're partners, but this time 50-50 split. And they're wondering what are they going to do in terms of having a venue to perform. And then Barnum gets the idea. They can get some land down at the uh, down on the coastline for next to nothing, and all they need is a tent. And then, boom, the big top. And then we get, and then we get the greatest show playing once again to finish off uh, the film. Yeah, with, very nice book ending. Oh, absolutely! Starting with the greatest show, finishing with the greatest show. But the interesting thing here is. Barnum is going to watch his kids grow up. So he passes the torch on to Carlisle to take over. And just the way Carlisle just comes rushing onto this onto the stage, singing his part of the greatest show. Again, the roar and the energy from the crowd in that moment, just fantastic. Yeah. And so and and Barnum goes back to his family with one of the elephants from the riding one of the elephants from the uh, from the circus, and he does indeed watch his kids uh, grow up. Uh, one of them continuing to do their ballet dancing, and her sister being, a, being an adorable little tree in the background. <laughs> and the and what a, and what a quote to finish the film on. And it's from P.T. Barnum himself. The noblest art is that of making others happy. Yep. So, where do we... As I, was, I was saying to... I was, I was saying to uh, Alan earlier that it's been a while since I've watched this film and I honestly forgot how much fun it is uh, to yes. watch for... But so now, now the important part, the scores. Yes. Where so, as always with the scores, for those that are, uh, for those that are new to the King of Isolation, we have five sections of the scoring to do. You've got the story, you've got the characters, you've got the visuals, the soundtrack. And the legacy, the lasting impact that the film has made since uh, its release. So, 
Right. This is a... It's not very often I say this, but this is a very tricky one to score in a couple of areas. Yes. The, the story being one of them. Yes. So, I'd say it's well-paced. Yes. It's... It's de- it's def- it's definitely got um, it definitely hits all the uh, emotional beats throughout. Um, again, granted, some historical inaccuracies, some of them not ideal, some of them justified. Yes, given like Alan said earlier, given what, uh, given what um, what the film is trying to be. Yes, uh, and that's thanks to director Michael Gracie, given what he and Jackman were aiming for with this film. Yes. To create, to create an original musical around the life of P.T. Barnum creating showbiz. Yes, not creating a straight biopic, but creating a show. Yeah, and I think as a whole, I would probably give I'd give the story here a nine on this one. Cause because like I say, there's a couple of historical inaccuracies that I'm not so much annoyed or frustrated about, but concerned that they didn't go all in with some of those, like case in point, Jenny Lind and and her singing voice. The fact that it wasn't a soprano, it was an alto instead. Yes. Um, and yeah, and it does have a lot of, you know, very familiar, like, story beats. You get in a lot of these stories. Yeah. Um, me, personally, I would give it a solid eight. Okay. Still, still, a, very, still a very respectable score regardless. Yes. So, so that gives so that gives it between us a score of eight point five on the story. Yes, commendable, highly commendable, yeah, absolutely. The characters, it's it's more it's more or less the same case here for me. Yes, uh, more or less the same case here as the story. Um, the characters very well written. Uh, they got they got great people to portray these characters mm-hmm. again. The Jenny Lind inaccuracy is a concern, and that's what bumps the score down for me. So, again, much like the story, for me, the characters get a nine. Yes, I'd agree with that. There we go. The visuals. Now, I would say the visuals and the soundtrack are easier to score here. Yes. Because... Those, you know, really highlight the show element of this. and Absolutely. Yeah, and just how stunning this show yeah. is. Yeah, and I'll say this right now. I genuinely cannot fault either section, the visuals or the soundtrack. I cannot fault either. And nope. the best part is they both have wow factors about them that help them stand out yes Yes. and those wow factors are what are needed to give each section for me that coveted 11 and it's not and it's not very often i do that but when i do you know there's definitely something very special that has that wow factor the yes. visuals, like I say, even just something as simple as the um, uh, as the um, the wish machine that uh, mm-hmm. Barnum makes earlier, and the, and then just the whole cinematic feel of the visuals when you see these circus shows in action in all their glory. The costumes as well are so vibrant, and yes. the time period is captured really, really well here, mm-hmm. and. We've touted it numerous times throughout this episode. The soundtrack is 
absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So like I say, both the visuals and the soundtrack get an 11 for me. Yeah. And you know what? I'd agree with that. There we go. So this is definitely going to be a very high. This is definitely going to be a, this is definitely going to be a strong score overall that this film is going to get. So in to the legacy of this film. Now, we've got the bog standard stuff. You get your box office, your critical reception, and you get your accolades. Um, so, with the box office, 219 days during its entire theatrical run. So you're talking almost two-thirds of the entire calendar year, from December right through until July. And that gave it a total of $174 million at the box office in the United States and Canada. And you get $260, $260 million elsewhere, and with the budget of $84 million, a worldwide total of $435 million worldwide. So that is no that is very, very impressive. $435 million at the worldwide box office. Thank really, really well done. And that's even against some stiff competition like Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. Star Wars The Last Jedi and Pitch Perfect 3. So that's so despite despite the stiff competition, to eventually go on to have a cinematic, a theatrical run of near, over 200 days and get over 400 million dollars worldwide at the box office, that's no mean feat for a musical. No. no. Yeah. Critical reception, on the other hand, is not so favorable, folks. Uh, because 56% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, the consensus says, the critical consensus reads, The Greatest Showman tries hard to dazzle the audience with a Barnum-style sense of wonder, but at the expense of its complex subject, far more in subjects, far more intriguing real-life story. Now, it's not the first time film... Uh, films have been criticized for not sticking as faithfully to the source material as possible. I mean, like even 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 some of the um, even some of the recent video game movies that have come out, they've been criticized. They've been uh, they've been criticized on Rotten Tomatoes, and yet you've got the audience on the other hand that absolutely loves them. Yeah, I mean. As I've said it a few times previously that we're now at a point where we're actually getting very strong, faithful video game movie adaptations. Detective Pikachu, Sonic the Hedgehog, which came out just a few weeks before um, the pandemic, um, the pandemic hit and we went into the first um, the first lockdown. Um, then you had, then you had uh, the. Then you had Mortal Kombat, which is what the 1995 film should have been. And yes, I have seen the uh, the 2021 Mortal Kombat film because, oh, well, for one, I'm a fan of Mortal Kombat, <laughs> and and seeing seeing this seeing the 2021 version be as brutal as it was, even. Even managing to pull off some of the classic fatalities from the games, what more could you want for us? What more could you want as a Mortal Kombat fan? Well, how about an update on Techno Syndrome, which was used in the original film at the end credits? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, actually, on the subject of Rotten Tomatoes, I wonder what the audience score is. For the greatest showman. Well, a very respectable eighty-six percent. Yep, sounds about right. Yep, and um, let's say and uh, let's say let's say video game adaptations. What else is it? What else is it? Uh, 
or there was there was Uncharted. It was Uncharted that came out last year, and Sonic 2. Idris Elba was hilarious as Knuckles. Oh, they are stairs. <laughs> uh, and then... And then in the world... Of, uh, and then we've got, like, the two big juggernauts from this year in terms of video game adaptations. The Super Mario Brothers movie. No joke, the song Peaches is eligible to be nominated for Best Original Song at the Oscars. <laughs> the scenes, if that song wins... I don't, uh, think, uh, I don't think it's necessarily going to win. I do hope it's at least nominated. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I just want to see Jack Black in that Bowser cosplay performing the song. <laughs> I mean, I mean, look, he's he's done it before. Why yeah. why not go all in and do it again at the Oscars? Yeah, yeah. And then in the world of TV, HBO, and The Last of Us, widely regarded as one of the greatest video games of all time. So no pressure when a TV series was announced, and incredibly, it stayed very faithful to the games and a great cast that included Pedro Pascal as Joel Bella Ramsey as Ellie and even Troy Baker managed to get a, a cameo appearance in one of the episodes uh, towards the tail end of the series and no surprise that with how successful it was midway through season one season two was greenlit and we are going to be getting that in 2025 so we've got about a couple we've got a couple of years to wait for the last of us season two and i for one can not wait for that because this is and, it, and it's no surprise that at the game awards that the last of us won best video game adaptation and rightly so and that's and that is impressive, especially when you had the Mario movie, where on release day, the first screening of release day, I was there for that first screening, sold out. The first screening on opening day was sold out. And but yeah. Uh, so yeah, here we go. Historical revisionism. So this is where we can delve a little bit more into these. Yeah. The Great Showman included many historical inaccuracies. Some of them I didn't even touch on uh, during the main portion of the episode. Vanity Fair called it a highly fictionalized musical biopic, which I think in a way could be a fair assessment. Yes. Uh, the, New York the New Yorker said that there's a sort of poetic injustice in the fact that The Greatest Showman, the new musical based on the life of P.T. Barnum, the long-famed Prince of Humbug, should be largely fabricated out of synthetic cloth. Hmm. Yeah, so yeah, a lot so a lot of these um a lot of these magazines and articles uh, being very critical of the historical um, inaccuracies. But again, like we've both mentioned, the approach was to create a show about how Barnum created show business. Yes. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I completely, you know, get where people come from with their gripes with historical inaccuracies. And, you know, it's a gripe for me in a way, but but because the film is not trying to be a straight biopic, absolutely, I have a, I have a bit more patience with it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, after seeing it for the first time, I saw it as just a great musical that I would absolutely recommend to anybody. Yes. So, yes, because. From the moment that from the moment that first trailer dropped, my interest had already 
my interest had already been uh, tweaked in a sense. Like, um, like my interest was like, yeah, I definitely want to check this out. In the same yeah. way when the trailers for Real Steel came out, I was like, yeah, this I definitely want to go and see. Yes. Even if, even if, even if, uh, when Real Steel came out for me, it was a case of it. Um, I, I, it wasn't showing at the uh, Odeon in air. <sighs> just a shame the Odeon's now. Just a shame the old the Odeon in air is now closed down because it and um, for financial reasons. Yeah. Uh, so the nearest the nearest one for me was Kilmarnock, but it was definitely worth the trip. Fun fact about the um, Odeon in air. When I was um, at mm -hmm. uni there. I, ah, I, UWS, yeah. Yep. I went to the Odeon uh, in air, and I was probably one of the few people in the whole world who went to the cinema to see Paranormal Activity, The Ghost Dimension. Oh! Ho, 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 ho. Ooh. I saw it in 3D. It was incredibly silly. <laughs> uh, a lot of a lot of people have said that that is definitely one of the weakest films in the paranormal activity franchise. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean yeah. I still love the series, but my god, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll say this: when I went to see Avatar: The Way of Water in uh, in 3D, I'm def I'm definitely gonna get quite a bit of backlash from this uh, to the point where I'm going to have the Simpsons mob at my door. I was really disappointed with The Way of Water, to be right. brutally honest. I was really disappointed because to me, it just felt like it was the same film as the first one. But you substitute the forest for water. Yeah. Speaking of um, sequels, I also went to that um, Odeon in there a couple of times to see mm -hmm. In my opinion, a very underrated sequel movie. Okay. Blair, Blair Witch. Ah, yes. Part of the... Oh, yeah. Blair Witch Project, yeah. Yeah. The the 2016 sequel. In my opinion... Ah, yes. yeah. In my opinion, underrated. Yeah. Might actually give... Might actually give that a watch at... Um... At some point, but I've I've got to make sure I watch the original first as well because uh, yeah yeah make sure you watch make sure you watch it with the lights off to get the full effect. Noted for future reference. So uh, <laughs> oh, that's gonna be fun. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, and another another one of my um, I'll say this this is one from um, this is one that's more more of a, a recent experience because like on Halloween itself, um, uh, because. Cinemas now have a thing for like bringing out these uh, like classic films for like a uh, couple of weeks or so. Yes. In this case, this was just like a, a one night thing, but my word, what a night it was! It was Halloween, and it was the Lost Boys. <sighs> one of one of my as I one one of, one of my friends they've um, they said it's one of their favorite films they've ever seen, and yeah. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely got, it's definitely 80s horror mm -hmm. done really, really well. Especially that theme song, Cry Little Sister. One of my personal favorites um, from that era now. Um, I, was, um, I just decided on a whim, I just searched up Lost Boys, and then lo and behold... It turned out it turned up on Amazon Prime, and I was like, "Yep, I know what I'm watching tonight." Yeah, but um, but now the accolades for the Greatest Showman. Ooh, well, it's it's a bit fifty fifty in terms of the accolades, but still doesn't mean that um, still doesn't mean that it wasn't. Um, Still doesn't mean it didn't get uh, plenty of nominations. It actually did get quite a few. Um, most of them granted for the music. But again, soundtrack, phenomenal. Yes. So uh, it did get nominated for an Oscar for Best Original Song with, uh, with This Is Me. It did lose out to Pixar's, Rem uh, Pixar's Remember Me from, uh, from Coco, which I was a little bit... 
I was a little bit annoyed about because I was just like, really? Another Oscar for Disney? Was it really necessary? But, but I can't deny the song itself is a, a beautiful, remember me, it's a beautiful song. I like it. Um, but um, it did end up two years running, interestingly, being in the running for top soundtrack at the Billboard Music Awards. Hmm. Nominated in 2018, and it actually won the following year. So that's uh, that, that's that's a pretty unique accomplishment, being nominated two years running and then ending up going on to win. Um, uh, top soundtrack. Um, uh, got nominated for three Golden Globes: uh, best actor, uh, best musical or comedy actor for Hugh Jackman. Uh, best motion picture for um, musical or comedy. Um, um, and it and it did win it did win their best original song for uh, this is me. Um, the musical comedy character uh, category. Um, uh, Hugh Jackman did lose out to. <laughs> oh, oh! I've just I've just seen what it lost to. Hugh Jackman lost out on the best musical or comedy actor Golden Globe to James Franco for the, the for the disaster artist. <laughs> oh my word! He lost out effectively to Tommy Wiseau. Oh my! Word. Oh, it was it was sort of like a, sort of like a retelling of how Tommy Wiseau created the Room, which is widely regarded as one of the worst films ever made. <laughs> But, but uh, yeah, and um, as it, and in the best musical or comedy motion picture category, it lost out to the lady. It lost out to uh, Lady Bird. Uh, yeah, but but like I said, it did win a Golden Globe for uh, uh, "This Is Me," and yeah, rightly so. Um, and uh, the soundtrack also managed to win a Grammy as well, best compilation soundtrack for visual media. And this is me, best song written for visual media, nominated for um, nominated for that award. Now, what would have won? Yeah, what would have won? Um, uh, best score, best song. Ah, yes. Well, a wor a worthy a worthy song to um. A worthy song to lose to "Shallow" from "A Star Is Born." Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. Uh, got nominated for a couple of uh, Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards, uh, favorite movie, and it managed to win for favorite actress with uh, Zendaya. So, fair play to her on that one. But the bulk of its awards came from the Nickelodeon. Teen Choice Awards. And it got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It got a massive nine nominations at the Teen Choice Awards that year. And uh, the four nominations, uh, four of those nominations, Choice Breakout Movie Star for uh, for Keela Settle. And yeah, understandable. Um, nominate uh, Choice drama movie actor for Hugh Jackman, uh, choice lip lock for um, Zac Efron and uh, Zendaya. So, so yeah, they've got some uh, interesting category names. Um, yeah, and uh, choice pop song. Uh, this is me. What did it lose to on that particular occasion? Uh, oh, 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 yeah. Uh, In My Blood by Sean Mendes. Fair enough. I say, oh, yeah, yeah. Teen Choice Awards, chart music. Keep that in mind. Uh, but the but the five uh, Teen Choice Awards it did win were for Choice Movie Ship uh, for Zac Efron and Zendaya. Uh, choice Drama Movie Actress. So, hey, fair play, Zendaya. Got a Kids' Choice Award and a Teen Choice Award to her name. So, not bad going. Um, Zach Efron beat Hugh Jackman 
to the choice drama movie actor. So uh, the apprentice be beating the master on this occasion. <laughs> uh, choice, dra choice drama movie um, for the greatest. Uh, it, what the, sh the film won uh, choice drama movie and choice collabor and it also won choice collaboration for rewrite the stars. So, so yeah, definitely, um, definitely an impressive haul. Thanks to Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey guys, let me have that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and now this. Uh, so we're going to a little bit about the. We're going to a little bit more about the soundtrack itself. The song This Is Me managed to peak at number three in the UK charts. And, but the album itself, the soundtrack itself, number one in the UK charts, number one in the Billboard 200. And it actually made it into... It was actually that successful. It made it into not one not two not even three but four or five year end charts so there's a lot of countries out there that are still uh either purchasing or streaming the soundtrack even six years after the film came out but the two main years in question here are 2018 and 2019 it was the highest selling album in the UK. And it was number four in the year end charts in the Billboard 200 in the US. It did get, it did top the uh, US soundtrack albums end of year chart. And people were still, people were still, um, people were still getting the soundtrack well into 2019 to the point where the soundtrack was still in the top three at the end of 2019 which is <sighs> not bad going at all yeah and i mean right right up in right up until 2021 it was still making it into the end of year charts in the US cuz it was um number f number f uh, let's see so yeah, number one in 2018, number four, 2019, num back up to number two in 2020, number three in 2021. So, so the places that managed to get it into tw managed to get all the way to 2022 were Australia, Austria, and Belgium. And the decade end charts, 21, number 21 in Australia. Number 10 in the UK and number 13 in the Billboard 200. And no surprise, it. Surely I'm reading this right. Surely I'm reading this right. I mean, plat quadruple platinum in the US selling over 1.6 nearly 1.7 million copies but the UK trounces that platinum eight times over with 2.4 million copies sold that's incredible that the UK sold more copies of this soundtrack than the US did. <laughs> but, I mean, but still, the fact that they're both multi-platinum on both sides of the Atlantic is yeah. no mean feat. No. So, the other thing is the fact that there is the potentiality of a possible sequel in the works. Hmm. Um, but there was also a Greatest Showman reimagined as well, uh, where you had artists like Panic at the Disco, Pink, Kelly Clarkson, uh, and you had James Arthur and Anne Marie collaborating on um, 
rewrite the stars. Uh, there was an there was a reimagined remix of This Is Me where you had Keela settled back, and you also had Kesha and Missy Elliott collaborating there, um, as well. And I've Which heard is, that there are, I've heard yeah. that there are also plans for a stage version of The Greatest Showman. I have heard, I have heard about this as well, and I, for one, really hope it comes to fruition that we get yeah. a stage version of this film because you can guarantee we're both gonna go and see it. Oh yeah. But like I say, the 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 uh, the uh, the soundtrack. Uh, the, the reimagined soundtrack, uh, number one in the compilations album uh, charts, uh, and yeah, there we go. That it, even the reimagined, um, even the reimagined version, uh, the reimagined uh, uh, edition of the soundtrack uh, managed to get platinum here in the UK, three hundred thousand uh, sales. Uh, it was gold, it was certified gold in the uh, in the US, selling half a million units. So. So yeah, I mean, taking population into account, you can understand why uh, the US would need to sell more copies to get gold or platinum status. Uh, but like I say the possible sequel here uh, in September 2019, a sequel for the film was was already in development, with Jackman confirmed to reprise his role. However. The sequel's future is now uncertain after Disney chose to end a distribution deal for uh, Chernin Entertainment's films by 20th Century Fox in early 2020. In September 2022, Jackman stated that he was still interested in a sequel being produced if both companies could come to an agreement. If they were to do a sequel, where would they go? What would they do? Would they focus or would they focus more on Carlisle running the circus potentially? Maybe, and maybe um, looking into where I don't know where circuses and showbiz as a whole evolved after the Barnum phenomenon. Maybe potentially, but we'll um, let's say, but still, as of yet, uh, we don't know if we're going to get an official sequel or not. But the fact that there's the post. But the fact that there was there was one in the works, um, and hopefully, uh, like Jackman said, hopefully companies, hopefully the companies uh, in question can come to some sort of an uh, an agreement to get the sequel back in the, back up and running. You know what might actually be surprisingly enough, what might be the deciding factor? Okay. Deadpool three. Well, 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 well. If Hugh Jackman will still be enough of a box office draw, then... True. That is true. I mean, the first two Deadpool films, they've done well at the box office. And this is the first Deadpool film that's going to be under the Disney umbrella. Mm-hmm. We have been we have been assured though that it's still going to keep the M rating. Yes. Oh no. Mm -hmm. no. The, the, the R rating. M ratings video games. Yeah, the the R rating. Yes. So yeah, I think I think if Deadpool three is another smash hit, and I think if there's you know if the studio see oh well Hugh Jackman is still as hot as ever, I think that could you know at least reopen talks of a sequel. Yeah. I, I could be completely mistaken about that, but I think that could be a factor. Yeah. So, we'll see what happens regardless, but the legacy for this film as a whole, the long cinematic run, the accolades it was nominated for, the accolades it won, the potentiality of a stage version of the film, the possibility of a sequel if the stars align. And overall, just how long the soundtrack spent in the music charts. You know what? 
trifecta of 11s. Let's give it another 11 for the legacy. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So now for the now for the important part, the number crunching, so we can work out what the overall score is. Because I think this is a I think in terms of the specials that we've done, I think we could potentially be seeing something at the top of the I board. think you might be right. Oh, oh my! <laughs> well, well, that is a turn up for the books. We've actually got a tie at the top, folks. Oh, the no greatest need. showman also has a hundred and one percent tied with the Muppet Christmas Carol. Well, how's that's... about that? How's about that? So, but again, those scores, the scores we gave in each section definitely warrant that overall high score. It's, it's a fantastic film. It's got great musical numbers throughout. And if you haven't had a chance to see this yet, it's on Disney Plus right now. Or if you're like me and you've got it on home media, Stick it on once in a while. Yeah. Put the sing put the sing along version along. Put the sing along yeah. version on and and just sing along to some ab to just the amazing soundtrack. It's but it's yeah. stunning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just not just from the visuals, but from the soundtrack as well. So yeah, without question, definitely recommend this one for those that haven't seen it yet. So yeah. Now that we've got the Christmas special out of the way. By the time by the time this goes live, hmm, what do I do? Christmas Eve or Christmas Day for this one? When do I put it up? Christmas Eve or Christmas Day? Uh Christmas Eve, I think. Okie dokie. Because you're gonna have because there's gonna be a lot of kids that are gonna be tuning into Sky Cinema to watch the Mario movie premiere on Sky Cinema on Christmas Day. I was thinking more about people spending time with their families, but yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's that as well, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'll so yeah we'll put it, we'll have this up on there uh, uh, Christmas Eve. So that being said, hope you guys enjoyed this um, episode of Mickey's Subsidiaries, the spin-off to the Kingdom of Isolation. If you did, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be part of the Kingdom of Isolation yourself, you can hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell, turn on notifications so you don't miss when an episode uh, goes live. I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm still gonna be busy chugging away getting the uh, animated classics lined up there done because um, from Christmas Eve. I've only got one week. I'll only have one week left to get the lineup done. Um, and at time of recording on December 12th, I've got about three weeks. I should be fine. So, that'd be, Sir so Alan, once again, thanks so much for um, joining me with, uh, uh, with this one. So, a pleasure and, uh, once again. Yeah, just, um, just a small idea uh, to pitch with you. Taking into account the episodes are not going to be as frequent once I get through like the main bulk, uh, and it'll just be like as and when the new films come out um, yeah. on Disney Plus. Would you be interested in being my co-host in the future for the King of Isolation? Depends on uh, my work schedule. That would depend on your schedule. Understandable. I'll That's give it some thoughts and I'll I'll get back to you on that. So yeah, the offers the offers there. But um, but yeah, that be, so yeah. Um, well while he's while he's uh, pondering on that, uh, hope you guys have a wonderful Christmas and a wonderful uh, uh, New Year. We'll see what 2024 has in store for us. And all I can say is I am ready for what 2024 has in store here in the Kingdom of Isolation. But until then, have a wonderful Christmas, enjoy the new year, and we'll see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation.